very much. <clears throat> you know, it's a pleasure to be here, and I hope um, um, you have a great conference. And uh, thank you again, Jean Louis, and the organizing committee. I wanted to talk to you today about non invasive methods for uh, cerebral circulation. And we'll focus mostly on transcranial Doppler ultrasound. Um, <clears throat> and then we will talk a little bit about xenon cerebral blood flow and just a little bit about a new technique, which is optic nerve sheath diameter measurements, ultrasound. Um, we've, we've had a great discussion about the metabolism um, with very elegant methods of uh, microdialysis and PET and so forth and MRI. And <clears throat> we're going to take a step backwards now and try to see what are the tools. And we're going to start with sort of the more non-invasive tools. And then we'll work our way forward with the series of lectures. <clears throat> How many people know what transcranial Doppler ultrasound is, have seen this before? OK, good. We can skip this slide. We'll go to, no. uh, this is, uh, so this is an ultrasound uh, uh, technique <clears throat> which allows you to uh, look at and listen, actually, to the blood flowing inside of the brain. And it, uh, you can have various kinds of probes that uh, <clears throat> are placed on the brain. I don't know if this works. Yes. Um, and you can incinate through the very thin temporal bone and look and listen to the blood flowing, and you can look at various waveforms. And this looks like, an like any other arterial sort of waveform, if you will, a systolic and a diastolic peak or a dichrotic notch. And you can track this over time. You can look at all of, well, you know, at least three or four of the major blood vessels, the middle cerebral artery, the anterior cerebral artery, the basilar artery, even the posterior cerebral artery, if your technician is very good. Most of the time, we are very focused on the the, inter, uh, the uh, internal carotid artery and the middle cerebral artery uh, for the purposes of looking at this really uh, under the cases of vasospasm. And here's an example of vasospasm, which is narrowing of the blood vessels in the proximal MCA, middle cerebral artery territories, causing this high systolic peak to the waveform. Whoops. And here is a, an example of uh, vasospasm. Uh, giving rise to very high flow velocities where the mean velocity on the left is 220 centimeters a second. Now normally, if you go back just a moment, what's a normal value? A normal value uh, in the middle cerebral artery is roughly 40 to 60 centimeters per second. So a very high vo velocity uh, indicates narrowing of the vessels, and you can see on the imaging at the bottom of the slide there uh, an example of a, of a study where the vessel is actually quite narrow. So what are the criteria? There's been a lot of, a lot of work on, on criteria for transcranial Doppler ultrasound with vasospasm. And, um, and, and I think it's very well accepted in terms of, of showing vasospasm. Uh, the, the exact cutoff, the exact thresholds are debated. Some people use the classical number of greater than 120. Uh, and the Lindegard ratio, or, or what is now called the hemispheric ratio, which is the middle cerebral artery divided by the internal carotid artery. And that ratio of greater than three would, would potentially indicate spasm. Now, some people don't believe that and, and find a number of people have those velocities are elevated, and they go for that criteria of greater than 200, uh, middle cerebral artery greater than 200, and a, and a uh, Lindegard ratio greater than six to really indicate clinically significant vasospasm. And we don't have the time to get into what, uh, what's cl clinically significant and silent, but that this is part of the debate. Um, I'm not sure you can read this. Oh, it doesn't too, look too bad. There's a number of articles such as this one. This is a review in the Neurocritical Care Journal in 2011. But there are a number of articles that, that, like this that look at the positive predictive value, the negative predictive value, sensitivity, and specificity of transcranial Doppler in detecting vasospasm after subarachnoid hemorrhage. And, and the data are pretty reasonable. And, and the, you know, in most cases, um, using strict criteria, you can really get good sensitivity and specificity using that technique on the middle cerebral artery. If you look carefully at this, the numbers sort of go down uh, as you get to other kinds of, of blood vessels. And it compares very favorably with imaging techniques such as uh, um, CT angiography or CT perfusion at this stage. So lots of experience, and a lot of groups are using this. Um, now, what's interesting, and this is a new paper that came out by one of my, my uh, former trainees who is now in Michigan. Uh, he looked at uh, looking at the, what's called the pulsatility index and looking at the, the drop in the pulsatility index being a marker 
uh, vasospasm. And he actually found that this was a, a significant and very predictive va uh, uh, marker of vasospasm as well. And we'll talk about pulsatility index in just a minute. Now, there are lots of things you can use transcranial Doppler for. I, I just want to give you a, <clears throat> a sort of a, a, a menu, if you will, or, a, or a, a, an idea of a landscape of what you can use it for, because I think that it is a powerful tool um, that can be used intermittently in an ICU patient. And one example of this is, a, is using transcranial Doppler to, reass, to assess and reassess recirculation after acute ischemic stroke. Uh, so a patient who presents with an acute ischemic stroke and you're thinking about, well, what should I do for this patient? What should I augment their blood pressure? Should I give them TPA? Should I give them uh, aspirin, antiplatelet medication? You can actually monitor them pretty frequently over the course of an hour or two and evaluate whether they have re constituted their, their circulation, if they have recanalized the, the proximal middle cerebral artery. And here's a paper <clears throat> from Demchuk and so forth where they've, they've actually described what's called a TIBI scale, T-I-B-I -I scale, and they go from zero to five. And you can see for yourself that there's, there's normal flow if your score is a five down here at the bottom <clears throat> and zero if there's no flow up here. And you can actually watch that over time. And a number of investigators <clears throat> have shown that if you have complete recanalization of the vessels, which would be a score of four or five, go back to that one in this range, four or five, then your final <clears throat> neurological score is going to be pr very low. A, a low neurological score here is a good thing. That's, it's, it's like a golf score. L the lower is better. Not, 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 uh, not, uh, not poker or bowling. Anyway, so that's, that's, a, that's a good thing. <clears throat> and in fact, here's a recent paper from this year where they've used that score, well, zero through five, uh, or one through five, to evaluate how big the stroke gets on your MRI scan. You may be aware that, that you can get a, uh, if, you, if you look at an M a stroke on an MRI scan, you can look at day one and day two and day three, and in some patients, the stroke grows and grows and grows on this, on this scan. And, then the, and that growth actually uh, corresponds to poor outcome. And you can use the transcranial Doppler to correlate very well with the lack of uh, growth on the MRI scan. So the better your score, the more open the blood vessel, the less the stroke progresses over time. And so it can be a, a useful tool to evaluate how, how open is the blood vessel and what should we do for the patient. A very exciting tool is called sonothrombolysis in, in uh, using TCD. This is where patients present with acute stroke, they get intravenous TPA, and they get real-time ultrasound that's a, that it, it's, it is administered for a short period of time, 30 minutes to 60 minutes. That's, that ultrasound actually disturbs the blood clot in the middle cerebral artery and helps the TPA get in uh, to the clot the surface area upon which the TPA may act on the clot seems to be increased. So functionally, it's a higher dose of TPA adhering to the clot and, and lysing the clot. And there have been a number of studies now that show this is, this is useful. Um, and in a meta-analysis, um, transcranial Doppler, this is, this is outcomes using TPA alone, TPA plus transcranial Doppler, TPA plus uh, transcranial colorized Doppler, and this is something else, which is a, a low-frequency ultrasound, which we won't talk about too much. But what they show is that you, you basically have better f functional in, independence if you apply the TCD with TPA. So TCD actually may be a therapeutic tool as well as a diagnostic or monitoring tool. Interesting. TCD as a non-invasive monitor of intracranial pressure. So transcranial Doppler, um, uh, has been studied in those patients who have intracranial pressure monitors in place. We'll hear more about that later. Um, and they've tried to do correlations between the ICP number that's coming from the monitor and the middle cerebral artery uh, velocities and other parameters. And so as, as we'll hear about, uh, um, there are a lot of factors which can compress the blood vessel. If this is a blood vessel here on the arterial side and the venous side, and you have brain edema, it can compress the blood vessels, and therefore it, it, it squeezes the circulation. And just as you can put a pulmonary artery catheter uh, in a patient and measure systemic vascular resistance, you can, re you can measure cerebral vascular resistance as well. And basically, uh, pulsatility index is a measure of cerebral vascular resistance. <clears throat> 
um, more or less. It's not, not quite, but more or less. Now, so you can look at this uh, compression of vessels and pulsatility index is this, is this ratio of systolic, peak systolic minus end diastolic divided by mean. And a number of people have, have used that to correlate with intracranial pressure. And they've used that PI, um, um, pulsatility index, in a formula that corresponds very well with ICP. And they've used some other derived measures of the flow velocities, not just pulsatility index, where they've put this, the, the numbers into complex formulas and come up with a good approximation or a reasonable approximation of the intracranial pressure. And I just put to you a, a few of the different formulas which have been seen. But essentially they're using the flow velocity, either systolic or mean, end diastolic velocity, systolic velocity, and blood pressures, mean arterial or diastolic blood pressures, in various uh, formula to get that ICP monitor. And here's a paper where they um, looked at pulsatility index. Remember again, this is pulsatility index, that formula. And they found that in patients who have inter high intracranial pressure, the pulsatility index is about 1.5, more or less. In normal patients, it's, less, it's one slightly more greater or less than 1.0. Normal, what's normal? Absolutely normal, if we were to do everyone's transcranial Doppler in the room, normal pulsatility index is about 0 0.5, 0 0.6. So 1.5 is, is you know, twice normal, if you will. And this is an area under the curve showing good sensitivity specificity of, this, of these particular cut points. In patients who, pres who have hepatic coma and have cerebral edema and who are coagulopathic and you don't want to place something inside of the brain because they may bleed, transcranial Doppler ultrasound may be a good marker for uh, brain edema. And you can see this is the, the, a course evolution in someone with hepatic coma. The pulsatility index goes up over time. And we'll come, we'll come back to this when we do our, our case study later in, in the week. Now, transcranial Doppler is not always accurate, and there's, a, there's debate as to what can be done, and there are papers that say, well, it's pretty good, but it's not really that good. So, so what, can we, what can we really conclude? We have, to take, we have to take this very carefully and look very critically at the numbers. And here's some data from our center from, from um, earlier this year where this is uh, mean intracranial pressure, and this is the pulsatility index, and you see that there's no correlation, really. It's, it's pretty bad. And so uh, our group has been trying to look a little bit more in, again, modifying the concepts of transcranial Doppler ultrasound and looking at high intracranial pressure. And one of the ways that, they've, that my colleagues, uh, Zhao Hu and, and others, have been doing this, these are mathematicians that can look at uh, analyses, is to try to take this, this is an intracranial pressure waveform, and try to create a, a mean waveform from thousands of um, uh, pulses of, of intracranial pressure and put those together and make what we would call a mean waveform. And the mean waveform for patients who have high ICP in the, the, color, the light colors has a, has a somewhat different morphology than people who have normal intracranial pressures. And you can then, you can track this over time and actually <clears throat> mathematicians can look at each peak of the intracranial pressure number and then can come up with a variety of formulas. It's a mathematics, mathematician's dream. We have, so far we have 64 variations of morphology for the intracranial pressure. It's not just one number, it's multiple things. Suffice it to say, if you look at a variation, and, and actually this is not just intracranial pressure now, this is actually the the, uh, the uh, uh, transcranial Doppler waveform. It has the same morphology. Interesting. It has the same morphology as the intracranial pressure. You can put this into formulae and you can come up with a non-invasive measure which, which accurately detects the ICP. So that's the future. We're not there yet. We're not really there yet. We're, this is still in sort of development, but this concept is coming. I would say within 10 years we will have a uh, on, on your transcranial Doppler device that you buy, there will be a, a formula where it says estimated ICP is this number, and it's going to be based on this technology. Now, you, we're going to talk about autoregulation in, in a little bit, but there, there, you can use transcranial Doppler continuous monitoring, put the monitor on, change things in the physiology, change CO2, blood pressure, et cetera, sedation, etc., and, and, and watch the change in blood flow.
And this is probably the most profound thing you could do in the intensive care unit, especially on the comatose patient. And this is an example of, of transcranial Doppler being used for autoregulation, where you have, if you, if you look here, if you start at this point here, which is a normal CO2, and you hyperventilate the patient, the blood flow velocity goes down. If you start at 40 and you hypoventilate the patient and CO2 goes up, the blood flow velocity goes up. And here's an example in a patient where they start normal, they get hypoventilation, then they get hyperventilation. And you can see this dynamic change. You can quantify that dynamic change, and you're going to hear about autoregulation later, and you can determine whether somebody is autoregulating or not. So then you can determine, where should I keep the blood pressure? Me, we've heard before, last night we heard that CPP goals are coming down. It used to be 80, it was a beautiful slide, 70, 60, 50, I like that. This is going to tell you in your individual patient where, where, where is best for that patient in terms of blood pressure and CO2. We've done some experiments at UCLA where we've done a variety, a battery of tests. We take the patient, put the monitor on, and we do CO2 hyperventilation, we do blood pressure regulation, we do sedation, and we try to find what's going on with that patient. We find that a lot of patients are not ischemic. Um, as Peter talked about before, ischemia is one important uh, variable, but not the all. We find that many patients are hyperemic, have too much blood flow. And it's really, this has probably helped us the most, and the concept has helped us the most in really treating refractory intracranial pressure. Because if you see that they have refractory intracranial pressure and their transcranial Doppler flows are very high, then it tells you there's too much blood flow to the brain. The brain volume is too high, and you can work on the volume. And let me just go to, oops. This is another technique, xenon blood flow. Walter Obrist, who invented this, this is a detectors that can look at various regions of the brain. That's what it looks like in a patient. You can look at various areas that change. I'm going to skip that. And this is opt optic nerve ultrasound. This is kind of cool. This is you put the ultrasound over the eyeball. It's a different probe, slightly different probe. And this is, you can measure, this is the eye here. This is the optic nerve. You can measure that sheath. And if that sheath increases in size, it's, it's, it's supposed to indicate high intracranial pressure. And here's a paper uh, with a reasonable correlation between the intracranial pressure and optic nerve sheath. Greater than about 5.5 or 5.9, optic nerve sheath diameter greater than 5.5 would seem to indicate raised intracranial pressure. Completely non-invasive. Um, this is going to be the part of the future as well. So in summary, non-invasive measures can determine hemispheric values for blood flow. These can be done at the, at the bedside. These are snapshots and not necessarily monitoring, so you, you have to use them frequently. There's a potential for therapeutic enhancement of blood flow in acute stroke. And you can inference uh, between transcranial Doppler numbers and intracranial pressure with some caution. And that, that's what I said. This optic nerve sheath may be useful in the future. So I'll stop there, and that's it. Thank you.